Wow. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, we did make a film together. What was it, 2011? Yeah, it was, but it started long before that. Yeah. Five years. Five years it took, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You were busy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you came to me to talk about it, remember? I did, I did. A lot of people wanted to do a film about George, and um, it was closing in. And I thought, yeah. if we don't do it um, from the home fire, it, it may not really capture who George was and is. Well, it took about a, about a year and a half of us, uh, you bringing a, a very special, um, very special um, um, letters, pictures, art artifacts of all kinds. And uh, it really was about a, a, a time for both of us to start trusting each other with uh, the kind of picture we wanted difficult. to make. I made it difficult for Marty because I would bring things and go, here, read this, oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, may I keep it? No, thanks so much. Uh, that took a while, and he was very patient with this letting go yeah. process. But it, it, it did seep in. As I always tell the story, though, I, I, um, I, it had given me some of your home movies, of the home movies that he had made, and I was uh, somewhere, and I said, let me put the disc in. It was a DVD, and um, it was just a shot of some tulips, <laughs> some flowers. And I'm looking at this by myself, and then suddenly there's an eye looking between the flowers. And then he tilts up, and it's George's face just looking at me. And I said, all right, I'll do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, was like, it was just meant to be, know. you know. But what, what's interesting to me uh, about this extraordinary, I think, the beautiful, the beautiful book is, um, you know, poetry is, in a sense, I can't define it, but it, for me, it's like a series of images, a juxtaposition of images. It's more cinematic, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, the images create emotion, uh, psychological, uh, psychological reactions, all sorts of things that uh, rather, rather than um, their impressions, images that are impressions, rather than uh, a straight narrative, rather than prose and narrative. So after all of this time, you know, how did you come from, let's say, how many things were there? There was Eric Clapton did a concert. Right, Eric did a concert, we did a movie, um, but we did a documentary. Uh, we released the rest of George's material. We, we put out two or three packages. We, we did a lot of work. We did our documentary and, and our book. So the time then was for you to do yeah. your book. I, I, it's, I, I didn't expect to write, to write this. And I think there was, a, there was some sort of tiny thing being held back that I didn't, uh, I didn't really realize was there. And it was uh, inspired and triggered by certain events and certain things I'd read and seen over the years. Even when Marty and I were working on this film, it was difficult, mm -hmm. you know, Marty's, Light and dark, you know, and you can't sanctify a man. Uh, yeah. you, you need to tell the whole story. How do you get through the world in this material world um, and still keep your eye on some sort of gold of your higher self? That's the challenge for all of us. And it was really a challenge for George. Um, and, and, and Marty, you know, it was about, you know, faith and devotion mm -hmm. to your own self and what you believe. And uh, that was what Marty was trying to capture, and that's really what we wanted. Um, and and then and now it's sort of time for me. Yeah, exactly. So this is your expression, ultimately. Um, and um, for me, it's uh, 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 it, for me it's fascinating that you chose poetry um, rather than. I say conventional is a bad word, but normally or conventionally, and it doesn't mean it's a bad thing, but a lot of people do autobiographies or uh, memoirs. Mm -hmm. um, but this is unique. This is very different. These 20 poems are an autobiography. It is autobiographical, um, some kind of narrative, and I didn't choose the form. The form sort of chose me. I, um, 
I didn't want, I never wanted to, to do an autobiography or a memoir. A lot of people in our circle and in the music business have written. We kind of overlap about certain mm -hmm. things. I, I just didn't want to do that. Uh, but I had no choice to do poetry because about five years ago, I had this, um, as they say in England, a funny turn. Uh, I had a, um, uh, a, a grand, what is it, a global transient yeah. amnesia episode. So I had amnesia for about 10 hours, um, which was not an entirely unpleasant experience. <laughs> it, it was very, you know, um, trans, you know, transcendental in a way and, and existential. And it took me, I, what I did learn from it was that um, when you're not making memory, you know, you're in the now. Mm. Do you lead a little bit of the past and the future so you know where you are? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I had none. So what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. Oh, we're here to see the show. Your closet when you open the It closet. was Groundhog Day. Yeah. You know, just kept asking the same question, but it was, it was complete innocence. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, everyone seemed, was very concerned, but um, I seemed to be enjoying myself. I, I just... <laughs> The doctor came the next day and said, do you remember me? I was like, mm, not really. <laughs> he said, don't even try. Uh, we don't know why it happens. It's just, could be this, could be that. Probably never happened again. I think it was overload. Mm. But what did happen was when I came home, I had a friend who is a neurologist, a highly esteemed geneticist as well, and he called me and said, your brain has had an assault. He's Icelandic, so your brain has had an assault. It needs a massage. You must read poetry for the next three days. <laughs> and he was a lover of poetry. And it was the most beautiful prescription I could have been given. And so I did. I read Mary Oliver. I read Pablo Neruda. And I, he, he, he meant to take it easy. And it was as if the the board was cleared for a bit, mm -hmm. and I read poetry. Uh, then on fourth or fifth day, I was cycling. Someone called me and said, uh, where are you? Oh, I'm cycling. Who's with you? No one. Uh, would you like me to stay on the phone? <laughs> no, I'm fine. Oh, you think I'm going to forget where I am. OK. So it reminded me of a story that uh, Jorge Borges wrote. Mm -hmm called Funus the Memorius. I know I'm going off here, but no, no, Borges, very interesting yeah. story about um, a man, Irenio um, Funus, who falls off his horse and hits his head. Now, instead of forgetting things, he remembers things. Mm. He's given the curse or, or gift oh. of memory. A memory everything. Yeah. And Ooh. he remembers everything that's that bad. happens in a day. <laughs> that's really bad. That's, yeah. a, that's, that's a great Borges story, yeah. yeah. It is. and he. He remembers the shape of the raindrops, the, the, mm -hmm. the movement wonderful. of a cloud, the way the dust blew. He remembered everything in a day. And sometimes he would live out that day in real time. Yeah. So I thought, OK, well, I'm on this cycle trip. I'm going to remember everything I see. And I started look, watching the surfer pulling off his top and the person wearing a pair of antlers and the sand blowing in front of me. And then I went home. And I wrote three poems. Wow. And that period of sort of five days shifted something in my, in my head. That's why I say the form chose me. And I started to write in that rhyming verse. And, and um, this is how but this the rhyming came to verse, be. You said the rhyming verse was uh, uh, one that you were aware of? Or, or did, it, did it go more in a natural way? In other words, something with your own rhythm and your own emotion. I couldn't, I couldn't not write in rhyming. <laughs> you know, I, I, there was, I couldn't manage to, anything that came to my head turned into sort of a poem. Um, but I had no knowledge, well, I've read poetry, but there are many, there are lots of rules, and yes. there's A, B, A, B, and B, B, mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. and uh, you know, iambic, mm -hmm. and, and uh, and I thought, well, a friend of mine said, don't write to rules or you'll never write anything. 
Mm -hmm. First of all, just just right. And um, so I did, you know. And and it just it, some of it. I have an emotional cadence. So I'll just. Yeah. And I, I don't know how easy that is for the for the reader, but you know, if you hear rap these days, it goes. It's yeah, certain, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, we yeah, have more yeah. freedom. Yeah. And I, I think my cadence. Um, you know, I was very much trying to stay in some kind of form of a poetry I recognized. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, when you get emotional, it just starts going faster mm -hmm. because things start pouring out, and yeah. it was really exactly. emotional. Yeah. So it leads to uh, leads to another spring. Another spring, which is the first yeah. poem in in this collection. Um, this and the last poem, really. I mean, next to the tree time, you know. Yeah. These are the two. You tell uh, us a little. The first and the yeah. last are really tied together, but um, another spring. One night, I was I was having a conversation with um, the ceiling, um, or God, or myself. And I was thinking, uh, I'd read, I just read a line by Edna St. Vincent Millay that said that April should be shattered by gust, that August should be leveled by a rain I can't endure. And I, that word April jumped out, spring. Oh, another spring. This was dark, the dark of November. And uh, we'd had, a, when we were young, you know, we were in our, I was in my 20s, George in his 30s, we'd had a visit by a famous landscape architect, and she said, you know, George, you only have so many springs to get your garden right. And it terrified us. We were like, oh, no, we better, we better get busy here. So it was always another spring. Well, we'll do that next spring. It's like, how do you know yeah, you're going to do yeah, it next yeah, spring? Yeah. You know, even now we say that. We think, we'll do it next year. Well, okay. All right. Um, yeah, inshallah. Inshallah. Inshallah is right. <laughs> And uh, uh, so another spring, I just, this poem sort of was a verbal, I didn't write it until after I said it, and I was saying all I wanted was another spring, was that so much to ask? And those moments when you maybe not understanding or, you know, you're a little bit angry at how life has gone, I thought it might be granted and we would see another April day that we would warm by each other's side. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's November, it's only April. Mm -hmm. We only had a few more months when we didn't make it there. Yeah. And so that was really um, how the, this but this the one, first one I this wrote. This one feels like a cleansing of some kind, a kind of purification um, in terms of um, the wind and the, the, the sense of um, uh, nature around you I somehow uh, almost like a ritual before you begin for the first for the first this, for the first yeah. uh, uh, step in this journey you know it this this really was the benediction yeah exactly of, of, of the book I think yeah um, you know if if you were uh, doing the Vedas you'd have an invocation and uh, and on that final day, I cleansed myself with water and air yeah. to be devoid of earthly residues that may have held you here. My scent or whimper, the smell of my hair, I wanted you to leave without any impediments of care. To float away like you always imagined and prepared, but I couldn't help myself and nuzzled your ear and whispered final words to leave you with my sound as a signpost to my soul wherever we are bound the formless state of nothingness where emotions are consumed. For now, alone in winter, feeling spring will never bloom. So on that day, it's, it was very ritualistic um, when, you're, when you're, you know, it's not a barrel of laughs, but it's like no, no. When, you're, when you're walking somebody, you know, birth and death, same thing. The same door swings open. When yeah. you're at a birth, yeah. you That's feel right. it. When you're at a death, you feel it. Yeah. It's an incredible experience. You know, sometimes they call the light under the door. Mm. You know, it's mm. right there. And, and, and you want to be prepared. You know, you dress to go out to an event. Well, you want to be prepared for that event, too. And you want to be clean. You want to be devoid of earthly residues. Mm -hmm. Because you want to help somebody mm -hmm. leave. You don't want them to go, oh, I smell that. I don't want to go. You know, I, don't, I, I want to be able to just be free. 
Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, as the senses shut down. Mm -hmm. So that's where another that, that That leads us into the journey of the book, really, which then the last uh, tree time, uh, I, I go to the last one only because somehow the two together seem to um, uh, uh, become like um, uh, the guides through, through the whole, through the whole. Uh, tree time, after this sort of benediction, <laughs> you know, as, as you say, it's, um, I wrote tree time. Um, I live in this house, it's a couple hundred years old, not old by English standards, but... Maybe um, you could describe it a little bit. Yeah, it, it's a folly. It's, it, it, it's a, a Victorian house um, with... A lot of friars. Very eccentric, <laughs> eccentric place. I mean, you know, there are blue grottos of Capri yes, under the right. pond. Yes, And uh, there's a, a model of the Matterhorn. Yes. So this big... Yes. <laughs> So this yeah, that's what that's where she lives. So this uh, this Victorian uh, who who was passionate about plant collecting, you know, he, he had the Matterhorn had been climbed in 1875. Yeah, yeah. So he had all his alpine plants. He wanted to display them. It's 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 an eccentric house, but it goes back to 1866. And I was thinking, well, who who actually had the land? Oh, it was I found out. I got all the deeds, and I found out Reverend Prowse sold it to Mr. Morton. Sold it to Reverend Collard, sold it to Frank Chris, mm. sold it to Lord and Lady David, sold it to the Catholic Church, sold it to George. I'm next. And it really hit me hard because Frank Chris describes the proprietor will then be rolled down the drive and he will leave and take no, no uh, last final look back because he'll be dead. And I thought, oh, well, that's me. I'm next. After this whole lineage of this house, it's me. And I started to write about it, um, how I'll go down the drive, descend the hill. I'll pass all the places that meant so much to me, um, you know, where we celebrated harvest moons and waited for meteor showers. And, and um, then I wrote it, and I thought, well, that's the end. I wrote the end. Now I have to go back and write the beginning. I was going to say the arrival. Is the other poem that uh, that this takes us back to the beginning, the arrival? Is yeah. A poem. Yes. So anyway, I, I I wrote the ending and 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 it was funny because I thought, well, that was quick. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> I need to go back and write something, and that took me to the arrival. And it's, um, you know, I arrived at Friar Park. I was in my twenties, and to me, I just realized it sounds like I'm. I'm writing like a, a, a 20 year old. When it yes. ends, yeah. you yeah. know, by the time it ends, it's, it's a whole other life. And I sound my, like an older person. But yeah, yeah, you I could, was full you could of feel wonder. it. Yeah, and then the first, in the first stanza in John and Yoko's long white car, eccentric in its fate, blacked out windows, Persian rugs, we paused at wrought iron gates. And it goes on through there until you arrive in the place and, um, um, you're there with George, and uh, we get to the stanzas about both young lead guitars. Yes, so, um, you know, so many people came in and out, musicians, um, lots of friends. Um, another lead guitar player. Eric. Eric Clapton. Yeah. Um, both young lead guitars traded licks as well as women. Female guile at play and damages damaging decisions, which way they would go, like trading cards so sadly, predictable exchanges, and yes, they ended badly. The triangle now a legend grows as it lives on, appeared to be three-sided, was more a hexagon. What felt like fun and freedom in a smoke haze of confusion were momentary fireworks in a decade of, of amusement. So that was sort of the 60s summed up in two verses. But it's interesting because you walk into a situation, maybe you could describe, it's like a person who you walk into a room and you realize there's a conversation going on that you're not privy to, not only is it a conversation, but it's an entire history. Yeah, I was, yeah, you know, um, George is so welcoming and, 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 um, and uh, never talked about anything in the past. You just, ah, okay. you know, so I just came in and then, um, actually I met Eric first, was one of the, you know, first people I met, and he just said, hello, darling. And, and uh, you know, 
gave me a welcome kiss and he said, well, you better pull up your socks. And, hmm. uh, oh, that's a bit of advice. In other words, you know, you're, you're in for a ride here. Mm. And, uh, mm. and, uh, and, and of course, they had so much history um, that I was a fly on the wall just figuring out what had gone on. And, uh, you know, so it, it was, um, I was really a fly on the wall. It was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you go to the end of the poem, though. I think the last two stanzas. Thank were, you, Marty, for reminding yeah. me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well... The poem sort of describes our life, describes some things that went on at Friar Park and what it was like. And, and then towards the end of George's life when um, time seemed to be running out. He actually, when his days were, seemed to be numbered, he, he was always in the garden, but now he worked. Working with a fervor, counting down the days, camouflaged in cocky, boot with knotted lace. He laid a serpentine of bark that led to his retreat. I cried near the sequoia, which became my weeping tree. Like the tangle of roots that sustain yet are unseen, his legacy surrounds me in the planting and the singing. I watched him shape the canopy, cut windows to the sky, saw sunlight falling perfectly on the goodness of his life. But you mentioned to me earlier that I didn't realize that he'd started this uh, gardening once he knew he was ill. He did. He, um, he'd, always, he'd always been in the garden. I think that's why he bought the park. You know, Liverpool has a lot of amazing parks. In fact, Olmsted, who did um, uh, Central, Central yeah, Park, yeah. you know, he was inspired by English parks. Ah. And... Um, this is not, it's not dissimilar. Wow. So George was um, from Liverpool, really inspired by parks. He saw Friar Park, and mm -hmm. so he spent a lot of time there, but he decided then he was going to create a woodland. Um, there were lots of hundred-year-old trees, but he just bashed his way from one end to the other. And friends came over and helped him clear. He planted 10,000 bulbs, planted, he bought 800 maple trees, and, uh, uh, you know, picked up moss from certain parts of the garden and put it somewhere else. And I would say to him, oh, where did you get that? He said, I'm telling you, that's my secret stash. Because <laughs> I was doing a garden over on the other side. I'd say, God, thanks. He was serious about this. But this, this thing is, it, it's, it's fascinating to me because it creates, it's about creating life. The life that goes way on beyond, goes way on beyond us. You know, as you said, when Danny, when he was a kid, you got a little tree. Now the tree is what? Well, it's like 60 feet high. <laughs> you know, there's trees that mark our lives. And, uh, and George knew it. He used to say, I'd say, oh, look at that maple. It's so gorgeous. Aren't you glad I planted that? And, you know, I am. I'm so happy. But there were, you know, there were, he knew, and as most gardeners know, that this is for another generation. This mm -hmm. is for the future. And, and he, in particular, was, mm -hmm. was creating this. And I stand and marvel at it now, saying, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. But it seems, it seems too, that um, the connection of, of your own mortality to, to I don't know, I'm, I'm from downtown New York, but, you know, um, I'm allergic to everything green. But, <laughs> you know, but I do know that's where we're supposed to be. We shouldn't be living in these, in these, in these uh, you know, filing cabinets. You know, we weren't meant to be, and we should, we're part of the earth as a living organism. You know, it really is. And um, uh, so to keep your hands in life and to create life, which goes on creating itself. You read the Hidden Life of Trees thing. You Hidden were mentioning that. Hidden Life of that. Trees. Also, Walt Whitman wrote in Leaves of Grass, he wrote, I bequeath myself to the soil that... Uh, of, of the grass that I love. If you, if you look for me, look on the soles the of soul your, your, your right. roots. Right, exactly. And uh, uh, Tree Time, this little book, The Hidden Life of Trees, Marty and I both read, it, it's phenomenal. And, and this is where Tree Time came from. Because, say, it takes about 200 years for a tree to move from one country to the next because it drops a pine cone or mm. a seed, and perhaps it grows. And then that tree, if it's not disturbed, 
we'll drop another one. Mm. Tree time. Oh, I got that all wrong. You know, here we are rushing around. We're just definitely, you know, we're, we're on this human insane time. That's right. And actually being aware of this tree time, it helped me to slow down long enough to find these words. Mm. Mm. It really did. Mm. It had a profound the sunflower. Just mentioned that thing about the sunflower. Well, so sunflower. I had. So I was thinking about these trees walking from like Austria to France, thinking, <laughs> "Geez, you know." And then I, and then, you know, I come along and go, "Oh, look at those saplings. They're going to be in the way. Take them out." They've been waiting there for like ten years to get to where they are. <laughs> so then I noticed I had uh, sunflowers in the in a walled garden, and then one summer, one of them had hopped out and gone towards a, towards a gate. Oh, that's interesting. And the next year, it got outside the wall. And I then started talking to it. Where are you going? Where do you think you're going? I told everyone, don't, don't, pick, it, don't pick it, don't move it, let it be. I want to see. It's on a journey. It's going somewhere. It's moving. And, and that's, you know, that's the joy um, in nature. And I, I think you told me, Maybe you told me yesterday that Native Americans don't have a word for nature mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we are nature. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's one. It's one. Mm -hmm. wanted to mention here um, the poem, Her or Me, which has kind of a nice little punchline to it. Yeah. I give it, should I give them the punchline? Yeah, you give them the punchline. Okay. What the hell? Um, This is a little poem. Um, sorry, I'm going to drop my things here. Three words of love, a kiss on the head, a hint of your smile so easily led by diminished chords and open tuned strings, Sanskrit mantras, om, freem, clean. My nervous whistle became the first note, soon to be known as a song that he wrote at the flick of a butter knife ringing a glass, cut crystal rhythms and spoon castanets. A silent guitar, sometimes ignored, then caressed and strummed, he fell in love once more. Rounding curvaceous, like a woman, you see, I wondered if he loved her much more than me. Hmm. Yeah, he was, he was, um, uh, hanging uh, guitars on a, on, a, on a wall and somebody had created these nice little hooks for him. And he said, you know, guitars are a lot like women. You know, some are very curvy, some are blonde, some are really thick, <laughs> some are really, some are dark, you've got redheads, you know, dark. The only difference is you can't hang them on the wall by their necks. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a joke that probably you know could be no, right. misconstrued. That's pulling up your socks. That's yeah, pulling that's... up your socks. But I thought it was funny. You know, he, well, thought, like, he thought it was funny too. That's why he built. You know, they're all like a you just bit, can't yeah. hang yeah. them on the wall. Okay. Yeah. After that, I just saw women hanging on the wall. On the wall. Oh God. Yeah. You know, really pretty women. You know, like. And then I thought. Well, they have. They have the sh it's know, a shape. It's, it's a, a shape. Thing. And then I thought, oh, that's why you're looking you know, at that guitar room. Look at Andy time. Griffith and facing the crowd, Mama Guitar. When Mama. he plays that, or B.B. Or, um, uh, King's guitar is called Lucille, Lucille. wasn't it? Lucille. That yeah, was the they're, name. They're, yeah, and, and then you start noticing the way they're holding yeah, the they're guitar. Yeah, they're holding it, yes. And then, you know, <laughs> let's get, in, <laughs> get into this, the vibrato and the... the <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to mention the slide and Never all that. I don't get into that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, come on, and the sound. It's electrifying. Very, Sensual. It is very sensual, right. and it, you're, you're part of the, the instrument is part of you. I mean, most people who are blessed who can play instruments, the, the instrument is a part of you. It's a part of your anatomy in a way. I it's know, wonderful. really, holding that mm -hmm. beautiful blonde. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that should take us to the, the he um, poem, yeah. uh, which okay. is really I, I, one of my favorites because it's like this whole journey of, um, of uh, uh, actually the Beatles meeting, Right? Or his, his, at, at his beginning with the uh, uh, two up, two down. That's what it is. Yeah, so I'm going to read part of it. Yeah. I'm not going to read the whole. I'll go from the thing to the end. Um, and it's called He Never Hurt No One. 
Born in a row of two up, two down, Arnold Grove unadopted on the east side of town. Two boys and one girl came the young son, a Pisces at midnight who never hurt no one. Boiled all that water on a log burning stove, shared the zinc tub, took turns with a soap. A mean cockerel out back, pecked and chased, a family determined to find a new place. A child in each arm, two sent away. During the blitz, it was safer that way. Young mother with infants under the stairs, bred ineffable courage, resilience, and dare. Fear rose fast as the doodlebug squealed. Both hopeless and faithful, she could only appeal to the glow of the Virgin to spare them this night. St. Luke's fallen, no peace in sight. Mm. That's, uh, yeah. The, the story that uh, you know, was so so amazing to me that you know uh, George was very uh, you know I said he was saying yeah my mother my dad would take um, people to the underground sh bomb shelter and my mother would stay home he was a baby must have been two two and a half and he had another brother and she would just go under the stairs and pull the table up mm -hmm. that was. It, and you'd hear the doodle bugs were bombs, you probably know, made this horrible squeal and then they'd go quiet and everyone would wait to see where it was going to hit. Hmm. So terrified, you know, I think she actually had a, a bit of a breakdown after, mm -hmm. after the war. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, she, I said, she must have been so scared. And she was, he said, and one night when we were under the stairs, she had a vision she was a devout Catholic. Um, she had a vision of the Sacred Heart of Mary. <clears throat> and that gave her courage. She knew they would survive that night. <clears throat> and uh, you know, how, how many years later, uh, George came to my house in California, and he walked in the house, and he saw the Sacred Heart on my, the wall outside my mother's <laughs> room and said, that's the same, that's what my mother saw. Mm. You know, they were both named Louise, which mm. is mm. amazing. Um, and they both loved the same song, which was incredible. Which uh, that? Maria Elena. Which, oh, Maria Elena, mine. Which was yes, made it's a beautiful famous by Los, Los Indios Tabajaras. Yes, exactly. fantastic. They, from Liverpool to Hawthorne, wow. California. Yeah. Even Wong Kar Wai used it as a theme in Days of, Days of, going, Days of Being Wild, I think, is a film he made. And uh, Los Indios Tabajares comes on. Yeah. I actually saw them perform on the Ed Sullivan Show. They were in, in, in Amazon Garb. Remember, they right. were with the feathers. It was black and white, but still. <clears throat> That's yeah. correct. And then Ray Cooter did a beautiful version. Beautiful okay, version. Yeah. 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 You'll the, want to hear that. The, it goes on to, to talk about the, the teenage scruffs. I thought it was interesting how you suddenly, uh, how you, you take him from uh, the, the baby under the staircase in the vision to meeting with the other guys on the bus. Three teenage scruffs on the bus home from school shared one obsession, and it wasn't to rule. The airwaves that carried a new kind of explosion rumbled the world and stirred up the doldrums. Scored hand-me-down jackets, changed the lapels, pegged some old trousers, and slowly raised hell. Buddy on the Gulf Stream from the west to the east, little Richard, Jean Vincent from the land of the free. <coughs> I'll go on a little bit. Oh, they, yeah. they learned every chord, figured them out. Bebop a lula, Lucille, twist and shout. Gathered momentum that never did slow till they couldn't contain it. But before the last show, he took a punch for Ringo, a nice shiner to come. It was worth it, he said, for him and his drums. I can see them now, sitting close, side by side, inside the laughing, saying goodbye. Our sleep was broken by an old-fashioned ring, that call at an hour you know is bad news. You're dreading to answer, but you don't get to choose. I whispered three times that dear John was dead. We curled up for hours, blankets over our heads. Paul, brave and kind, hid the shock he endured, hoping then realizing there would be no cure. I don't want to tire you, I won't stay long. I saw their lips moving, but only they heard the song. It's a well-known story, now legend it seems, to the school that said he'd never be anything. A Pisces at midnight, his totem the sun, and in all his days, he never hurt no one. 
<laughs> that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Well, we, that'll take us right to heroic couple, I think, uh, and also to uh, uh, the final one, I think. But uh, heroic couple is an interesting term. You, you talk about where that came from. Heroic, I saw a heroic couplet as a poetic device um, used in uh, narratives and uh, epic poems. Shakespeare used it. Uh, Chaucer used it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, never heard of it, and how I read it was heroic couple. Um, and uh, I thought, oh, we were pretty heroic. Mm -hmm. that, you mm -hmm. know, we had a couple heroic moments. Um, that was the uh, night of all things, the turning of the earth, the, 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 turn of the, the end, the end of the millennium, the beginning of the new millennium. It was, uh, new Year's Eve, 1999, this happened. All right, we broke into the house. Yeah, I mean, Marty and I were talking about celebrity, this whole yeah, yeah. experience, but, you know, on the evening, uh, on the, some of the evening that turned from nine to zeros, mm -hmm. you know, a demented person broke into our house and tried to kill us. And uh, uh, it was interesting. I wouldn't say, what I said before, not an entirely unpleasant experience. This was entirely unpleasant right, experience. Right, right, right. And, and very cinematic, which is why I can talk about it a bit, you know, especially with Marty, because, uh, um, you know, you're, 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 you're in it, but you're also watching it. Mm -hmm. And, you're, you know, George was doing that kind of, oh, oh that looks good. You know, he, he, he said later, I had the director's shot. You, you know, uh, because he was on the floor. On the floor, yeah. And um, I don't know. The, um, the details of... Why I wrote... The, yes, so, you know, I, I, I wasn't quite certain why I was writing this uh, poem for this book. And I didn't, I didn't really come to understand until I got to the end. And, uh, you know... It, it's quite a statistics that, you know, two out of four of those guys. Right. So, you know, would have been an attack like this, and you, you wonder, what is, what is it with this obsession? Um, and, you know, I learned a lot from it. I, I, learned, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about who, who I am. And, uh, and the capabilities that a human being has, mm -hmm. and also that um, in, in silence, you know, in your movie Silence, it was a lot you know, about apostasy, about yes, apostasy. Denying, denying, yeah. denying your faith, denying, um, uh, it's really about, I mean, you can talk more about that just right now. Why don't you just explain about apostasy. About giving, yeah. yeah. About the, 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 the whole idea was, um, to me, in, in, in what's fascinating about the way the poem resolves itself is that he would not allow his death at this point. Right. You see, he reclaimed his death as his, you know. Think about apostasy. First of all, we had to, we had to renounce our... Uh, pacifist nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was when I was Well, saying, that was the other thing, too. When you said you're, you're capable of, you, you don't, you, you hadn't ever been in a situation like that before, and yet you were capable of extraordinary strength. You didn't even realize there was a, there was a, uh, a knife until the end. Yeah, so, I know, we don't want to scare you all, but, um, you know, here's the thing, in that split moment, you know, everything you believe, uh, I, I, I do no harm. Mm-hmm. Well. Do no harm. I mean, that's, you know, in Buddhism, you, you know, you make a little vow. And first you start making little vows that mm -hmm. you can keep. Mm -hmm. It's like giving. Um, Rinpoche said to me, you know, uh, he was talking about the Heart Sutra. Practice giving by giving from your right hand to your left hand. Mm -hmm. To yourself. You feel nothing. Then you give some vegetables back and forth. You're giving it to yourself. You're not giving it away. Practice that. Mm. Then practice giving things that have no value and you don't care about. 
and just keep doing it and doing and it until keep, you yeah. can <laughs> just give gold and you don't think anything about it. Yeah. And there's no stain on that giving. Right. There's no regret. There's no stain. That, I mean, I've, I'm just saying that because I, I, I found it was a, a beautiful teaching. But the same thing with a vow of do no harm. And suddenly, you're doing harm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's only a second to renounce your beliefs. That is the first thing to overcome, mm -hmm. um, unless you want to just close your eyes and, and leave go. your body. Yeah. And go. But, you know, you, you're, you're fighting out of love. There's no anger. There's no time for anger. There's nothing to be angry about. You, you don't have a grudge against anybody. It's just love that is propelling you. And, you know, it, the statistics were not good. They were not in our favor. And, you know, we fought really hard. And when I got to the end of this poem, you know, I'm writing, death proper, not imposter, um, came, came one day. And, you know, George was not going to die like that. And even though he died so shortly after, he died on his terms. And that was really the importance of, of writing this. And I'm so proud of him. And, you know, we fought so that that was, you know, that, that John Lennon didn't have um, a chance to die the way he wanted yeah. to was yeah. hurt George more than him actually dying. Yeah. And he said, that's so unfair that he didn't get that chance because John knew. You know, they spent a lot of time together meditating and talking, experiencing, expanding their minds, and, uh, and he knew. And he wanted to die on his terms too, and he did. And I'm really proud of him for doing so. And that's why I wrote Heroic Couple. <laughs> That leads us to came the lightning. But the lightning is spelled differently. Could you explain that one? Um, yeah, it, it is came the lightning. And um, I mean, I'm going to read this one for you, but uh, maybe I'll read it first. Mm -hmm. It makes more sense. In the three and final days, the world just fell away. Your essence in its glory wore the thinnest shroud of life. So sheer it barely covered you. We were not meant to see the glow of your transcendence, a being nearly free. Gone was everything you ever thought with nothing to recall. Yesterday of no consequence, tomorrow not at all. Forgiven and absolved, nothing left to fight. Your time had reached the moment, came the lightning, came the light. We shed all expectations of what we thought would be. You let go of all you loved. One of them was me. Our last embrace was reverent. It sweetened our goodbye. Now mendicant with empty hands, possessing no more ties. The cloth of life now faded, but love the dye that lasts. There appeared one more desire, like a late arriving guest. It quickly stirred our urges to hold each other tight. You faced the last temptation, came the lightning, came the light. Um, this one is really about attachment and letting go and non-attachment. Um, in the three and final days, the world just fell away. And there's a Buddhist thought about the letting go. And, you know, also the dissolution of your elements. Mm. If you can look at it like that, my earth is going back to the earth. Mm -hmm. You know, my water is returning. Mm -hmm. That would make it easier all, for all of us. Mm -hmm. But um, um, this, this thing happened, um, you know, gone was everything we ever thought. We weren't talking about business. We weren't talking about music. We weren't talking about um, yesterday. We were just in the now, and George became brighter and brighter and, and lighter. And there was a moment when um, our son walked in the room, mm -hmm. and he just lit up. 
as if he hadn't seen him in a hundred years. And it was the most beautiful moment. And I thought, that's who you are. No angst, no regrets, no attachment, no, no, attachment, no desires, nothing, just love. Mm. And that is the lightening. And, uh, you know, I, I could only wish for that for myself, that I could, that I could be letting go. Uh, George always said, you have to practice it. It doesn't just happen. But it's, I think we're, we're, we seem to be a culmination of our attachments. Yes. You know, from yeah. my morning coffee to mm -hmm. a crossword puzzle to the view I want to see, I have, I'm attached to all these things. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I, I, I was lucky enough to see uh, Marty's next film. Oh, the Killers of the Flower Moon, yeah. And uh, an amazing movie, and there was a scene in it that reminded me of, um, of this letting go. This lesson of letting go. Here's a, a human being, George, letting go of his life. And he, he said to our friend one time, you know, and later he said, geez, I hope I wasn't too hard on him. A friend of ours was, you know, had limited amount of time. He said, you know, you're going to have to, you know, let go, uh, yeah. let go of, of that and that tree and your garden. In fact, mm. Derek, you're going to have to let go of your body. And it was like, oh, okay, you know. And he said, I hope I wasn't too hard on him. I said, well, you know, anyway. Uh, so... Um, I, at some point, um, I went to India with uh, George's Ashes and, a, and uh, a, a girlfriend who had also lost her husband, another musician and good friend of George's. We went together, and Danny was there. And uh, uh, we were doing, sitting on a, the ghat. The Ganges was flowing by, this very fast current, the water is, it's really up north. The water is blue because it's so cold. It's practically ice. And um, we were sitting, we were in the water as well, but we were uh, sitting on the edge. And at the end of this puja, we had these offerings. We had rice and marigolds and, and incense and things. And, and um, we'd finished this, this uh, long ceremony. And... Uh, the priest started pushing everything into the water, and I, my girlfriend and I were trying to grab flowers and something <laughs> because we always have to have hold on to something. And you know, we were trying to take this, there would be no souvenirs from this. And he was brushing and brushing, and we were like, ah. And, and so he just looked at us like, what? Uh, you know, you're here to let go. <laughs> and, uh, and there was a little picture of George in this thing. And Danny showed it to him, and he went like this. And, you know, we're like, oh, Westerners, really? And he, we tied it up, and we put it into the stream. And we went, walked back inside uh, this ashram, um, and it had been empty when we walked out. And when we returned, there were like a hundred swamis in there eating lunch. We said, what happened? Who are all... Well, a great yogi died, and, and we're honoring him. And uh, it made me feel like we were doing it for George. But um, this swami came up to Danny and said, um, are you a student here? And he said, no, I just came to honor my father. He said, good. Now he is free, and so are you. Mm. And... You know, really something to, um, that is, he, he was so certain of, and yet something that we have to, under, you know, understand or try and, you know, try and realize. It's, it's, it's one of the great gifts of, uh, for people to learn, for all of us to learn. I mean, especially in a culture that is acquisitive. Yes, yes. It's about taking, consuming, eating, you know, all of those sort of things. So it's... Uh, Constantly consuming, constantly attached, 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 attached needing attached. more and more and more. Get rid of it all. You know, you got to get rid of it all. It's very hard. But then you won't be able to your family, too. Even the last picture, the last little thing, the last probably thing. my mother's yeah. that I keep with me. Yes. I'm going to have to get rid of it. But not right yet. Not right now. No. <laughs> I know, but, the, I, you know, watching your movie with the indigenous people. Yeah. yeah it's, and, then, and, then, and then remembering that experience in India, and I thought, wow, and then all of us in the middle who were just hanging on, and they're just letting go. Mm -hmm. So there's something to be learned. 
we have to um, eat, can we sum up with death is good for the garden because we, do we have time for the questions? For the audience? I don't From know. the audience? What? Do we have time? Well, I guess, let, let's do the, the death is good can. for the garden. I think we should okay. finish with death is good for the garden. Yes. Sorry if we've gone out a bit. It's a large, yes, big yes. subject. Um, but this is the, uh, the one uh, um, uh, that uh, when you talked about now that he's not here, um, what does it mean for you? What does it mean for you and Danny? You know, This is a, a process. Uh, this poem, Death is Good for the Garden, was sort of a process of how I felt and feel and how um, it, it happened between me and the garden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The day of his death, gravity reigned. Grass at attention to soften my fall. I grabbed those soldiers with both fists, threw rocks at the lake and scared all the fish. Ignored the buds and leaves unfurling, snapped bare branches I knew were not dead, struck a bird with spikes of a fallen chestnut, crushed a toadstool underfoot like a cigarette butt. Until I could not harm another innocent friend, I felt remorse, then blamed sadness and began my amends. I found a suitable home in dappled shade for blue poppies that suffered the glare of the day. Cut away dieback to borrow the long view, gave whimsical shapes to the topiary use. I fixed a glass house, returned it to glory, with a gate leading nowhere as the end of the story. Grew Italian sweet peas so they would entwine where rampant magenta clematis climbed. Planted a Mardi Gras dahlias and buddly a harlequin, to draw monarchs and bees for flutter and hum, the soundtrack for a garden with sounds of no one. Seasons passed, I watched the color wheels spin, communed without, but not yet within. Each summer I ate what grew from the earth. In September I walked melancholy, just as one should. Chill winter I curled up and burnt all the wood on the shortest day so I could hide in the dark without a calendar to make a new start. Finally, brave snowdrops cracked frost and freeze, reviving the faith I had in renewal, a vacant heart lit by spring, the crown of all jewels. Bohemian shades and tulip a queen of the night, primula candelabra in every color but white. Scalloped hedges, a sea monster, tiered plates, sacred mound, let doves nest in the chimney, shooed geese, Canada bound. Moved trees like rooks, dried flowers, pressed one type of leaf. I lost track of time. And finally, I lost track of grief. Death is good for the garden. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Great. That's great. We have a few. We have time for a few questions. Okay. So this is the first one up. It's wonderful. Um, no one around you will carry or, or carry the weight. Carry for you? the uh, the blame for blame you. Blame for you. It's you that decides. What's your interpretation of this lyric and George's um, run of the uh, run of the mill in general? Run of the mill is one of my favorite songs of George's, mm -hmm. and yeah. at the end he says, uh, "Yeah." No one around you will carry the blame for you. How high will you leap? Will you reap enough for you to, will you look enough for you to reap it? Only you arrive. Only you'll arrive at your own made end with no one but yourself to be offended. It's mm -hmm. you that decides. It's about how you live your life. And um, how you live your life is how you're probably going to leave your life. And is this Toby Carmichael? No. Not at all. No, but he did like Hoagie Carmichael. But he loved Hoagie Carmichael, Hoagie Carmichael, and he would have been very flattered if yeah. he thought anyone he was, thought that. Uh, Carmichael, come on. Yeah. yeah. Um, another says from Carly online, love the poem uh, Song for the Sun. Has Danny read it? He keeps telling me he has, but uh, uh, I don't know if Danny's read it. He, uh, he, he says it makes him very emotional. You know, I thought if... I'm writing about George, but you know, what if I don't write anything about him? That's mm -hmm. why I wanted to write it before it's too late. You know, 
two nights before we had the attack, I wrote Danny a letter, which I never gave to him, saying something really uh, prescient. I just said, I want to write this to you before you can no longer hear me. Mm. I have no idea where that And came you never from. gave it to him? Never gave it mm. to him. It was, but something was telling him there was some, something coming. But you also told me as you were leaving one day, fine, a couple of days later, you felt the thing leave you. I mean, in a sense, there was something that had helped you I, through. I, yes, after that um, uh, experience, um, you know, I, I never, I, I'm not, I think I kicked a boy in the shins once. I never forgave myself. I, I did kick a boy in the shins. He didn't deserve <laughs> it. And so, so having to go through this, you know, um, episode, um, uh, a couple days after that, big battle we had, I heard something in my DNA say, um, I'm leaving now, you're safe. And I, I sensed, I really sensed, I, I saw um, this being, this entity that had come to help me fight. That's all I can say. You call me crackpot, but no, uh, but uh, but I, I really did. You know, I mean, um, uh, something said you're safe now. I I I'm going to leave, yeah. and I yeah. do believe that something. Um, I, I wrote in the poem. It wasn't just the two of us who did this fight. No, um, help you with the job. Yeah, yeah. there was yeah. there was some force that um, that that helped. I could. I, 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 I mean, knew it. I knew it at the time, actually, because I, I felt mean, something grab. That's the thing when you, you you hurt no one, and uh, you know, and then all of a sudden the pacifist path, and then all of a sudden everything changes within a second. Yeah. And you have to stop this person, and you have to protect your yeah, person think, you love yourself, but you have to stop them. Yeah. And as you said, there were no words. Spoken. There were no words. Nobody was talking. At one point, I just said, "Stop! Like this is stupid. Nobody wants to be doing this." You know, I felt the mother in me just said, stop, stop it. it. Yes. But it didn't stop. And, uh, yeah. and I, you know, so thankfully we saved that person from killing us because mm -hmm. he would have had to live with that. And I think mm -hmm. I did you a favor, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I don't know who, you know, he was a mentally disturbed yeah. person, but like, who was he? Yeah. You know, in this play, in this ruffle of the pages in the order of all things, where mm -hmm. did he come into it? Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. um, this question is, Bob Dylan once said, the highest purpose of art is to inspire. How has uh, George's music inspired you the most? Uh, in, in, in his, you know, he was pretty funny. That inspired me. But also songs that were more serious, like Beware of Darkness. Mm. Really, he wanted to say, be aware of darkness. Mm -hmm. But he wrote it the other way. And I think that's a, you know, he also wrote a song called Be Here Now. Mm -hmm. And remember now, be here now. And that always brings me back to a point. It's a mindfulness before people were thinking about yes. mindfulness. Yeah, exactly. And of course, Richard Alpert, Baba Ramdas, wrote that book, Be Here Now, and, uh, and George used that. That inspired him. So this inspiration is mm -hmm. passed mm -hmm. along. Mm -hmm. uh, this just says here for both Marty and Olivia, what was it like working on the documentary together? Well, it was amazing. It was really one of the most amazing experiences. At, it was difficult at first, and um, uh, you know there were certain things I didn't, you know, I I, I didn't want to see. Yeah. Danny was very very good. Danny said, "Mom, you can't, you know, you need to have the dark and the light." Mm -hmm. And I thought, "Yeah, no, I'm letting go. It's okay with you." And uh, I I think I'm really fortunate to work with Marty because he has educated me in film. He sent me silent films to watch at the beginning. Oh, did I? Straight Angel, Mornay oh, Borzaghi, Borzaghi. Morneau Borzaghi, Borzaghi yeah. those films, and, uh, and, um, and so many other films. And then uh, Marty's restoration, film preservation. Well, you've, been, you've been restoring the films that uh, you've done about five or six of them now, I think. Yeah. 
and Amarada and uh, what's the latest one? The uh, latest one is El Bunuel. El Bunuel. Mars Film Foundation has been restoring films and preserving films that probably where you're all seeing, and uh, they're really, they need to be preserved, and through the Material World Foundation, we have restored, I think, 13 films now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We just came back with Margaret Bodie, I think, who's here. <laughs> just came, came back from the Morelia Film Festival where they screened Boonwell's El. Um, we did an Amarada. We did Los Olvidados. Yes, Los Olvidados, too. And uh, yeah. beautiful films. We did uh, Color of Pomegranates. Oh, uh, uh, Par Parajana, yeah, fantastic. Parajana, Russian films, English films, Colonel Blimp. Colonel Blimp, also. And, uh, Life and Memory of Colonel Justice, which is a beautiful documentary about <laughs> injustice mm -hmm. or on... That's something that is fairly relevant. That was Alonzoin, right? Uh, no, no, um, um, uh, Ophuls. That's right. Yeah, Marcel Ophuls, yeah. And... Um, these films, they look, L looks stunning. Everyone was talking about it. L is still shocking, isn't it? It is shocking. It's, 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 uh, it's one to watch today. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, kind of a horror movie. Yeah. Well, Bunuel's still modern. He's Very. Still, he's still modern. It hasn't aged any of his stuff. You know, even the Mexican films, I'm talking the ones he made in the uh, late 40s, early 50s. Fever rides, uh, Rises in El Pao and death, death Across the River, death, death by the River. It's just, uh, they're beautiful and strong uh, and still, um, in a good way, um, uh, for me, disturbs you to think another way. Not that you're in the process of thinking, but it takes your mind and your, your soul somewhere else. Um, so in a sense, you could say shocking. Um, and it's, it's good for the system to be shocked that way. It is, you know. and I mean, I don't know, I, I forget now what year L was made. I think 51 or 50, Something. yeah. It is, in its black and white yeah. simplicity, it is so shocking. Yeah. And uh, Margaret and I were saying, it's kind of a horror movie. People were really moved by it, mm. um, because it, it, it deals with mental health, and it deals with rape, and abuse, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. abuse mm -hmm. of power, and paranoia, mm -hmm. but, but there's something in it. It's not just a horror movie. I mean, it's a really interesting No, you see, that's the film. thing about him. It, it, it just keeps, the depth is there, and you just keep finding more and more. more. Even this version of Wuthering Heights that he made, I think in 53, I may be wrong, but uh, beautiful stuff still. So we've got more to do there. We do. There's a couple more um, <laughs> I'd like to do, and I'm, it just, it was wonderful working on the documentary with Marty and I, I'm so glad it's there and it stands. And well, with David, David Tedeschi, and you know myself, and we just we all sort of stumbled in a good way, stumbled, uh, organized stumbling. Yeah. it's such a massive undertaking that, that uh, so when, when the guy looked at me through the tulips, <laughs> I said, "All right, all right, all right, okay." There's something there, and I was always in my mind, I always was fascinated, not fascinated. I really believed, and was very. Uh, annoyed by the uh, cynicism of the 60s to a certain extent. I mean, I was 21, 22, but when they went to India and the Maharishi and people were laughing and making fun, what is it? Don't they think that we could learn something maybe from another culture? Yeah, yes. You know? Uh, uh, and I got very really annoyed and I saw that, that uh, uh, he went on this um, um, long pilgrimage, so to speak, uh, to, to um, the final thing of... Um, of letting go. Exactly. He went on that. That's this is the person we should this is the person we should be concentrating on. This is the person who might we might learn from. Learn something. Yeah, learn something he learned from them. In the uh, in the film that uh, uh, living in the material world there was a um, a letter that George wrote to his mother when he was 22 years old mm -hmm. saying he just started meditating. She was worried that Maharishi was going to take all their money and right. you know, just be well, careful yeah. what you're doing and yeah. stuff and he said you know, just like I knew something I was going to be famous, now I know I'm going to reach the real top of what a man can achieve. Yeah. That's not it. Whatever he had, that's not it. He was 22. Yeah. And, um, you know, just wanted to know so this isn't it. Well, what is it? Yes, exactly. And, yeah. And, um, you yeah. know, he, he... When I was in India, oddly enough, I sat on this ghat and I looked across the Ganges... And I said, what's that over there? They said, oh, that's Maharishi Ashram. 
Oh, I had I no idea I was <laughs> taking him back to the very first oh my God. place. That is no wild. Idea. That is wild. So. No, but it's, um, so I think that's really about it. Um, Thank you. Thank you, everyone.